have been nominated, because you guys aren't so great at nominating, um, tell fill out a fa panel. And this is something that I think is very relevant, and I run into it every day. So I'm going to look for some thought leaders and some people that can help me. I think we did, who did we have nominated first? We had one nomination in the back, come on up. We, where are we putting these? We put them right here? Perfect. Ad hoc, we're gonna walk right into this. I'm gonna pull some people that I know or I think might be fantastic. So we are going to chat. Everybody's looking down They're like, please don't say he knows me. He might pull me on stage. So what I'm looking for is people that are in this every day that have to deal with the legacy systems, that have to move things. You're nominating yourself, fantastic. You're up. You're up, head up there. Head up, head up there. We're gonna chat. We got two more, perfect, one, two. I think we've got a, we've got a panel. Um, I'm certainly happy to talk and sit on the panel with people. It's something I deal with everybody. How many have we got so far? One, two, three, four. If people want to listen to me chat, I can, I can chat. You want to be on the panel? Do you, do you have strong opinions on how this should be done? I have strong opinions. I don't know what I want. Okay. Well, it's up to you. I will leave it to your discretion then. Bowen, you walked in late. Now you're on the panel. Perfect. I like how this works. Perfect. We got one more. Awesome. I think that's a panel. And I love that it's a random panel from people in the industry. So let's introduce ourselves. My name is Trent Cameron. I help run this conference. Um, I'm also in my day job. I work for a small company called Truemark. And we're a managed SRE, managed... Um, service provider, um, we also migrate and help people come to the cloud, um, which means I run into legacy systems every day um, and have strong opinions about how they should be worked. Uh, my name is Jaime. Um, I am trying to do my own thing right now, but uh, also st strong opinions about, <laughs> about certain topics. Depends on the topic. Uh, um, to, to the person who wanted to expand the definition of customer, let me just say that if you water down the definition of customer, you start losing your why because you lose contact with, uh, you, you break the chain of, you know, why you're working on whatever you're working on. How does that actually bring money to the company? If you've diluted your uh, definition of customer, that's going to cause you to dilute that as well. My name is Brandon. Um, I work at OC Tanner. I've been there for about a year. And uh, in terms of legacy systems, we've got a whole lot. So <laughs> Trent uh, is currently helping us with those. My name is Allison Pryor. I'm a senior security specialist solutions architect with AWS. Uh, but prior to that, I dealt with security and DevOps and the security lifecycle and decoupling the death spiral that is uh, legacy systems and security. Uh, my name is Bill Moore. I'm a solutions architect for uh, my own company called Atmosoft, and uh, we do a lot of work with uh, legacy systems, upgrading them, moving them into the cloud. More from the development side, but we do do a lot of DevOps work. Thanks. My name is uh, Thomas Bell. I'm lead uh, infrastructure architect for a company called Deep Sea uh, and Draper. Uh, we build AI models for uh, banks' operations, and uh, I have a background. Uh, work in for a little over a decade working as a developer and operations and um, at large companies and and startups uh, alike so a lot of a lot of legacy systems in my experience I am Bowen Masco I work for Walmart we manage the in my team manages the ingress stack for walmart.com and related properties uh, our our main code base right now is in go and it's over like 10 12 years old there's like, we're like the third generation of developers that have been working on it. So it's a legacy system. It's a legacy Go system. That's, you don't hear about that very often. All right, perfect. So let's get rolling. What, I mean, legacy systems encompass is everything, right? So we've talked about everything from, I've dealt with this week, old Oracle, we should ask that. Well, that's a, actually an inter interesting question. When we say a legacy for the panel, 
What do you think of? What are you working on currently that's legacy? We got the we got the go answer. Go ahead. Yeah, that's. Uh, for me, we've got a bunch of apps. So we have Linux systems that are on five, six, uh, seven, and it's upgrading all those OSs, doing a data center move, um, and then eventually getting off of those apps onto our new apps. So there's just a ton of stuff. And then documentation between these systems is completely different. I mean, sometimes you get a lot, sometimes you get a uh, little. Um, and I mean, just the other day, it was like, well, we touched this seven years ago, and we don't, you know, nobody knows. It was just like everybody shrugged, and we're like, well, seven years ago, somebody was here that knew what was going on. So it's definitely been difficult uh, to, to work through those types of problems. And then when you have to make an upgrade because a customer is saying it's not good enough, it needs to be better, then that's when you really run into these troubles of having to figure out, well, how do I make this old system do now what I want it to do? that it, it was okay then, but it's not okay now. Yeah. Oh. So from the audience, how many of you guys have Linux? My mic doesn't like me. How many of you guys have Linux systems older than, say, Red Hat 6? Couple, couple of hands. Everybody else is scared. That's good if you don't. I, I, I run into those all the time. All right. What's the legacy system for you? Um, well, with my current job, uh, the most recent one that I helped a customer with was an airline company that FedExes SD cards around the world to load content onto airplanes. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty old school, um, but now they're going to be able to do that over the air. Okay. Um, previous jobs, uh, everything from figuring out how to run uh, Windows 2008 mm -hmm. in AWS to a 25-plus-year-old SAP environments needing to be modernized. Yeah, that's a, that's always a, who has an old SAP environment around. I'm seeing the same hand. Oh yeah, there's some more. I know there's I know they're out there. Uh, old Windows boxes. What's the oldest maybe I'll get somebody in trouble, but what's the oldest Windows box we have in production? Oldest. So, who has a like a 2012. I have 2012. I think that's one. 2012 is definitely one. Who's older? 2003. What, what do you got? I, I, I 03? Server 03. <laughs> oh, in prod? Wow. Okay. That, that is impressive. Your name will be withheld. You're behind the cameras. You're fine. <laughs> wow. XP and prod. Anybody got 3 1 running around? No. No, no. XP is it. You, you win. Docking you later on your phone. <laughs> give, give that man a book. <laughs> All right. So, so okay. Well, let's keep going. All right. So uh, I, I'm working on a, a legacy system right now. The company that we're doing work for is uh, trying to migrate to uh, a, another platform. So we're currently maintaining an ASP.NET web format that was written. I mean, web forms has been around since 99. I was doing it back then. And so, uh, yeah, so, and it's, it's one of those situations where, you know, every time you touch something, something somewhere else breaks. And so we spent a lot of time just breaking it out and, and then getting the components so that the website doesn't go down all the time. And then obviously they don't want to do, put a lot of money into it because they're trying to migrate somewhere else. So it's not like you don't get a lot of time to fix it. It's basically like just keep the wheels on the car and, until we're ready to retire the vehicle. Yeah. And that's scary, right? Because we're not trying to modernize it. We're just like, leave it alone, leave it in the background, let it don't run. Touch don't touch it. Yeah, there's certain areas where you're, areas yeah. in the code where you're like, I've, yeah. I've seen that with lots of customers. Yeah, yeah. All right. What's, what's a legacy system? So, yeah, a legacy system is anything that I didn't build. <laughs> uh, no. Fair. Uh, True developer. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, you know, one thing I find interesting about legacy systems, so-called legacy systems and tech debt in general, is that uh, even when you're in a startup, like I'm in a startup, I've been in a couple of startups, and what I find interesting is that you still have legacy systems, they just evolve much quicker. So I was like, oh, that was built six months ago, that's a legacy system. But then you have, like, I worked at a large uh, restaurant chain globally, and they were running on Oracle and all these things, and uh, I th uh, to me, it's just like a legacy system is just any any system that uh, prevents you from uh, achieving some sort of goal, either in the short term or the immediate term. 
and uh, needs to be refined in order to achieve that objective. Yeah, I think that's a really apt definition, right, of what a legacy system is. All right, Bowen, what are you doing to combat the Go funness? Like, I mean, Go. You think of Go as a fairly modern language. What, like, what challenges and how do you how do you start to address that? Uh, so ours was started. The original code base was like sort of like Go point nine or point eight, and so a lot of the what is now current paradigms in that language were not, they were just done completely differently. Uh, primitives that exist now were implemented by themselves, like custom. So it's, it's kind of like the basic, oh, we're gonna touch this piece, let's modernize part of it to give us what we need to be able to then add this X feature. So, so really not much different than you do with, say, a monolith. Yeah. Where you're just saying, hey, let's isolate the API calls. Let's duplicate what's going on. Let's update it. We've got to be backwards compatibility. How do you deal with backwards compatibility there? Or do you? Do you just say the world is going to break? Or do you actually deal with backwards compatibility there? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, that's why things take longer. Is, <laughs> uh, a lot of feature flagging. A lot of, like releasing two features at once, or the old feature and the new feature. Uh, uh, we have a way for tenants to be able to like enable what they have in their production configs. And so um, we'll like add the feature, and then they have to go and enable it, and we get everyone using the new feature, and then we can finally remove the old feature. So it's like year to year process sometimes wow. to like migrate. So how do you deal with the underlying data stores there? Because that always is a question for me, right? Like feature flags are great, but we've made all these changes and we probably made changes to our underlying data. That's a long period for data divergence. How do you deal with that? Uh, we're lucky in that most of what we run is a proxy. Um, so I don't have a database in the same sense of like a business, uh, like customer management, but we do have the configuration of, of for a given domain, what uh, configs do we apply to that? So what things do we do? So part of what we do is uh, optimization of assets and things like that. So uh, we will at times, uh, just the same way is people have to set the uh, second, like, like the new version of, of the config, and then we'd have to deal with both at the same time. Yeah, it's, so. How do other people deal with it? So, uh, I like to uh, basically do do a level of abstraction. So, first thing I want to do is I isolate the model. So, I'll, I'll convert the existing table into, or data elements into a view, and then I'll, I'll point the code to the view. Then, then I'll adjust the model, and then I'll update the code. Okay, so layer of abstraction to get around it. Yep. Other, I can see a lot of head nods here. Other ways around it. No, no. Huh? You just I've, break everybody all at once. Break, say, like, I have seen that work. I mean, it does. Well, if, if you warn people ahead of time and say, this is going to happen. Yeah, and, and there usually have to be dire financial consequences if not. Otherwise, the business is not on board, right? Yeah. yeah. So how does legacy relate? Uh, that's an, well, let's go back first. We, we talked about a lot of things. Does everyone know what, on board? Feature flags, everybody understand what those are, how those work? Okay, database models, perfect. Okay, let's keep going. I, had, I just, in yeah. re reference to your comment about the business um, not buying into like refactoring legacy systems, I think this is like a really important point because uh, first off, as an infrastructure person, uh, I'm kind of, it seems like I'm separate and apart from the business, but the first thing that I always talk to when I'm working with people is like, all right, well, I'm the business too, so that's number one, we're all the business. And then number two is uh, when it comes to tech debt, it's like, as engineers, um, it's kind of nobody else's job but ours to worry about tech debt. And when we go to, if you go to a, like a business person or a COO or, you know, someone that doesn't have a technical background, you say, oh, we need to refactor this thing, it's gonna cost $2 million, and they're gonna say, okay, what's the ROI? And he's like, I don't know. Um, so like, part of solving tech debt, one is like, sometimes just work with your team to do it, to achieve the objective, and like, the CEO doesn't need to know that you're making a, a field change on a database, just do it, number one. But number two is figuring out ways to, what I call speaking the language of capital, because 
oftentimes in IT, we, uh, we forget that everybody else speaks a different language. They don't know what the hell story points are. They don't know any of this stuff, uh, but they th speak the language of capital. And figuring out how to translate what we're doing as a infrastructure or software into how does that translate to bottom or top line numbers that a CEO can understand? That's how you get investment and buy-in, at least has been my experience. No, I 100% agree, because if you don't have that, it just doesn't work. They're going to be like, you're going to spend five months and I get nothing. Really? Yeah, that yeah. really doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. So what so, do you do? So um, I, I like the whole Lean XP type model. Um, He'd probably be mad if I called him out, so I'm not going to say, but he's here today. Uh, my mentor who taught me about this. Um, I'd been trying to figure some of this stuff out on my own a little bit, but, uh, but he was able to show me like, how to make a migration work for the business. A big part of that is working in to every change you make, this sort of stability. Like You're not going to do it big bang all at once. Yeah, you're not going to get that five months uh, to go redo everything. But... Um, but you can leave a trail of goodness, and you can, um, you can as you're doing your, your work, you, you, uh, if you get another a request that's, that's going to affect that system, uh, you can explain, like, this request is going to cost more, because in order for us to do that and, and, and not make everything fall down, we also have to do this. And uh, that's a little bit easier um, to, for... Uh, them to, to understand and, and to buy off and, and for you to be able to sell because, uh, like you're saying, right, uh, to be able to talk to them about the, the language of capital, the, the things that are going to be important for them. Here's a good example of how we need to, you want that thing right there. In order to get that thing, there's some stuff that has to be done. We don't have to go crazy, but we do need to do this minimally. And being able to, to do that um, gives you that that bridge that you can walk across. No, no, great points. I think we had a question from the audience or a comment from the audience. I was just gonna say, I think as far as business value that it's starting to change and become more obvious. Like we just talked about MFA for 30 minutes and we talk about breaches. Well, I, anybody can understand a security breach, right? So, so that is one way that you can start to drive changes. Be like, I mean, it can look pretty ugly sometimes to point out holes or problems or things, but, or, or say, well, if I get this new version or I do this major upgrade, I'm gonna be able to enhance it with these five features. And those are, those are top line features. Security is becoming a top line feature. Um, you know, reliability for web properties is, is a top line feature, right? These are not um, non-functional requirements anymore. And we just need to make sure that we don't talk about them like they are um, and just politicize that, publicize that. No, and I've seen, that, I've seen that approach work many times, and I, I totally agree with the security approach to things. Um, you know, 2012 comes up, no more patching for 2012 anymore. <laughs> Red Hat 6 is gone. Red Hat 7 is not long lived. Um, and when you start to have compliance and regulatory things, that, that, that becomes a huge issue. I had another comment right here. You can steal my mic. Okay, trying to think about how to word this, but. Uh, my job is contract IT, and so we have a lot of customers around the valley that may speak the language of capital, but we still need to maintain their systems. And so oftentimes, I have difficulty convincing them, hey, this server that's 12 years old, we need to upgrade it. And they say, well, it's been running for 12 years, so what's the risk? And so, you know, how can anyone speak to maybe how to convince them? Yes. <laughs> uh, it comes down to quality. Um, so to the person who was talking about security, um, security is often the thing that nobody wants to talk about until really bad things happen. And the conversation comes back to more quality. If you transition from just speaking pure security, you must patch, you must update, you must upgrade to, hey, what happens when this goes down? What happens when that server finally crashes and burns? Yeah, it's been running for 12 years, but Great, now it's out of support. So what's gonna happen if that fails to your business? And it becomes a conversation not just about security, but risk, but quality. How do you improve the quality to your customer, to your business, 
through the concept and the, the constraint and view of security, enabling the business to be able to continue to operate in an appropriate fashion. And that's one of the biggest things with, from my experience, coming from the security perspective, working within DevOps, is that it's not a conversation of security, it's a conversation of quality. Because all developers love good quality code, but they hate having to do security work. And if I come as a security person and say, hey, your baby is ugly, <laughs> everyone's like, how dare you? But if I say, hey, you need to address these 673 vulnerabilities and patches, you're like, I don't have time for that. So the function of security is simply pointing out that, hey, you've got some quality enhancements that you can make to your code, because security is simply quality. You look at every single security vulnerability, it's a matter of just doing the right thing in your code. Yeah, we had another comment. Yeah, so on this particular issue about like upgrading a server or something like this, so I, I kind of like analogize it to when I was uh, when I was younger and had substantially fewer resources, I had to go get my car fixed, and it was like running the brakes or something, and I took it in, and you know I was like, can you just replace the brakes? And they're like, yeah, sure. But we also found that you you need new shocks and struts, and that's going to cost you three thousand dollars, and um, and I'm kind of like, well, you know, I just kind of need the brakes to work. Um, and when you're talking like to a company, when you talk about like talking the language of business, you say, oh, it's been running really good. And you know, that's from a COO's perspective or a CFO's perspective, like that's a good freaking answer. Like it runs fine, it creates the capital, it, it's generating revenue, why should I change it? And you have to start thinking like, okay, you have to go back with that and internalize that question because that's a really good question and start thinking, okay, is it costing too much to support? Are there security uh, holes? That's a risk that needs to be mitigated. But not all security risks should be mitigated. So, because you know your job is, as when it comes to security, is not to eliminate risk; it's to mitigate it. And we have to start understanding these trade-offs when it comes to capital, and then being able to communicate that back and say, we need to upgrade this server, maybe because support's going away, or maybe because we spend 10 hours a week supporting it, and this translates to this much uh, on the bottom line. We think it'll cost this much to improve. And just start uh, being able to communicate with the rest of the organization in a way that they're gonna understand um, is so crucial. And I think that's, we need to start internalizing some of these questions from the rest of the business and say, you know, these are good points. And we need to understand that and communicate back in effective ways. Yeah, definitely agree. So uh, total cost of ownership, I think, is what you're getting to. Because one of the most influential uh, PowerPoint slides that I've ever seen was, the number of active, real-world vulnerabilities based on the operating systems that were actively running inside of the environment to show that if you're running Windows XP, you have n number of vulnerabilities that are actively exploitable versus, say, Windows Server 2016 or Linux 9 versus 6. And the conversation is that your ops teams and your security teams, your dev teams, have to spend more time making sure that they're not going to be compromised by running on older technology. If we look at other third-party products or vendors that have been compromised over the last five years, it's the same thing. The longer you go, the more total cost of ownership in operating and executing your, not just applications, but your infrastructure, that needs to be brought into that conversation from a finance perspective. So what we're saying is that. the 86 Corolla is old. <laughs> it, it may still, still runs run great. well. But it still <laughs> runs great. I dump oil, a quart of oil a week, it's fine. Okay, next question. What, what are the questions the audience have? That's a really good question. No question, no one has any questions. Oh, we got a question in the back. We have a mic runner. Perfect, thank you. But it is a hard question, and finance is so much. It's funny because we're a bunch of you know DevOps nerds, right? Like, but finance is so much a part of making good decisions. So my question slash comment it's it's around not just the operating system, right? That needs to be upgraded. Uh, sometimes the tools running or the applications running on on those servers depend on tools like Apache, Java, 
uh, Tomcat, you name it, right? And, and if you have an application that was written, I don't know, seven years ago in Tomcat 7 with Java 7, right? Taking that step of, you know, going to, let's say, I don't know, Windows 26 and Ubuntu 2022, whatever, right? Then it also implies that it's gonna take time and resources to get to get those applications ready to run on a newer versions of the tools. Um, so, I think that really is a good point, and it brings me in a good direction. Container containerization. Let's talk about containerization in legacy systems. Who's seen it done really well? Who's seen it done poorly? I've seen both. I've seen containers that shouldn't have been containers. <laughs> but I've also seen them do some things that I'm like, at first glance, that should never be a container. But then I look at it and I'm like, but that was brilliant because it got you out of a bind. You know, you're running shared isolated systems that now, like, it's a legacy system. You've run a legacy system in a container. Is there an oxymoron there? How have people, other people dealt with containers? I mean, on, on the legacy system, that's, that's the whole breaking the monolith pattern, right? So, so that, that, I've, I've, I've done that too. So the system was huge. It's a legacy system. And then I isolated the pieces and then put them in containers and then, then hosted them and then stuck an API in front of them and then, then just get everything communicating and talking together. And then, then you still kind of have the monolith pattern, but you're also working on a, on a pattern that's it's a little more sustainable and you know maybe sure. this container slowly needs more pr pruning the tree yeah. off making it a little yeah. shorter yeah well, who else well I was gonna kind of I think what you're getting at Bill um, is uh, we think about like monoliths as like these big servers that sit but th they look like monoliths because they're servers either physical or virtual EC2 instances uh, but in reality they're not monoliths no server is a monolith there's all these different services running on it mm -hmm. and they're all communicating over a network. So you don't have to say, oh, this EC2 instance, I'm going to turn this into a Docker image. It's like, no, just take the Tomcat instance and put that in a Docker image. And now it's communicating over localhost on that network and start teasing these pieces out. And definitely don't go to your CFO and say, uh, we need five months to deploy Kubernetes to refactor this EC2 instance. Like, you can start with just deploying the container to the EC2 instance and abstracting these pieces bit by bit. And then before long, you got the whole thing containerized. and then you can start thinking about orchestration tools and those kind of things. Uh, but yeah, just starting to tease apart these components within these monoliths. Yeah, so so really something nice. that comes up there that I find fascinating is networking. How do people best deal with networking? Who's had good experiences and bad experiences with networking? And as you pull these pieces apart, because they used to live, I mean, they used to communicate on local host over a socket yep. or else directly, right? Oftentimes code paths, we didn't even deal with the socket, right? We just called the, it was all part of this monolith, so we just called into the code. Um, how, do we do, how do you guys deal with networks? I like, I like an orchestration layer, especially if you don't want to modify the underlying code a lot. And, and you just kind of want to get, pull it out and get it hosted, and then you can add the intelligence on the orchestration layer to so get you that. So are we talking like an Istio, or are we talking like what are we talking about orchestration layer here? So so usually I do I I just done I just done custom ones, not like because so we're working on a microservice to pull apart an application, and so it's just a small custom orchestration engine that kind of gets that that code by default didn't have the network latency or retry or you know uh, circuit breaker patterns or anything like that. So you just kind of put some of that infrastructure on top, and then you route it through the orchestration and then it's kind of handling um, the code underneath and the calls and the APIs and it handles the network. So you're abstracting the network yeah, away, yeah. okay. Yeah, and I'd say like we deploy Istio in our, we have a pretty sophisticated ecosystem with Kubernetes and Istio and, and that kind of thing. But the first thing I would say is on the networking is if you have to remember IP addresses, you're doing it wrong. So I'd say, especially if you're trying to refactor a legacy system, start with service discovery in the simplest place is DNS and start thinking about that at the service layer. And then uh, instead of trying to think about it at the network layer, you know, you need that layer of abstraction that already exists. I, I think, it, I find it funny because there's this topic about service discovery and all this stuff and it's like, and early in my career I did, I was like, what does it mean by service discovery? And it's like, well, they mean DNS, that's what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's semi-fair. I think we had another comment. Did you have another, okay. I, I would agree. I think networks are fascinating. Um, because it's not always just service discovery, right? You have all kinds of weird things, especially with legacy systems. I find so much that, yes, sometimes there isn't a DNS record, but oftentimes, like, it's static. And so finding that abstraction and finding those balances and figuring out, well, how do we deal with a network and how do we deal with 
this abstracted network, right? Because certainly in a container environment, if you have an IP, you're doing it wrong. When you don't have an IP, you shouldn't know what it is. Um, and I think that is part of my big struggle with containerization sometimes, is figuring out how the networking is abstracted, how we're pointing at services, how we're, we're say DNS, but DNS, DNS doesn't, TTLs are, yeah. TTLs are hard. And I would, I would say also like the, um, the network is sort of the new frontier when it comes to uh, DevOps or whatever you want to call it, like next generation digital systems because uh, like you said, Docker simplifies the deployment of the system but it complicates the communication of everything else. It does. And yeah. it, you, you really, and starting to understand that abstraction. And what it's challenging about the network is it's what like you might call a cross-cutting concern. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't really think about it. We think about it as its own entity, but really it like mingles across everything. And that's where like service mesh tools are so valuable and important, uh, like Istio and those kind of things. Uh, but yeah, that's, I just want to add that. One of my favorite haikus is that DNS. It's never, not DNS, never, DN it was DNS, right? Um, and it happens so much. Like it's, it's actually interesting, the cross-cutting concerns like you were talking about. It's, it's funny, I went to the cloud and I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, uh, and, and we're gonna talk about databases here in a minute, but. I was like, RDS is amazing. It just flips it over. Magically, I have you know primary, secondary, just just change places, and it just works. It's amazing. And then one day, AWS had an outage on the control plane, <laughs> and I was like, Oh, DNS doesn't work. And they're like, 100% DNS works. We just didn't update your primary and secondary, and so you can no longer talk to your database. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks AWS. But it's amazing how often that you know is a concern, or a a service is the cache their TTL. You know, as we're moving to this, hey, everything's mobile, everything's not at a static IP address. It's it's interesting how that happens, and, and all of a sudden DNS caching is a big deal. So the first rule is the cloud is magic. Oh, it is not magic. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> it takes a lot of hard work to make the cloud work. But it can seem like magic, but it can be, it's definitely magical. Yeah. It's not magic. Agreed. Question, we have another question? If not, I want to talk about databases. No questions. Oh, we have one in the back. All the way in the back on the aisle, red shirt. Yeah, just give me a second to, you know, what? traverse. Where's your all transport? The way back here. I know. You, weren't we supposed to have those by this time? I thought we were. Awesome. I watched Star Trek as a kid. Was it you that had the question? Awesome. So, we are talking a lot about the legacy systems. I want to know for the panel, uh, for those who still have legacy system, what are your biggest blockers to come out of those legacy applications? Like, uh, are there any plans? Or if not, what are the technical challenges you are still facing? Maybe talking about the biggest challenge, not all. The biggest challenge, that, that, that's a good question. The biggest challenge, I'll, I'll let the panel go first. Let's, uh, let's go down the row. Yeah, go ahead. So in my team, uh, we're still dealing with legacy systems, again, that we were built a year ago um, that we're now running into problems. So I'd say prioritization and manpower are by far the biggest issues um, in just tackling the technical debt and getting it forward facing. So would you say showing business value for those things? Would you say? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily business value because the product itself still provides that value, but the backlog of things that we need it to do continues to grow because they're dealing with older technologies that were built to make it work back in the day, but again, they didn't continue to manage that and now they're dealing with the technical debt before they can actually get into all of the enhancements and product features and making it, it actually it does be keep burying itself yeah all right what bigger biggest blockers so uh first of all uh show of hands how many people here are not day-to-day -day technical like management c-level anybody we've got a couple okay cool 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 um one of the uh, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen is actually uh, I, I like to say the hard problems aren't the technical problems. Um, one of the biggest challenges I've seen is actually organizational design, mm -hmm. and um, organizational design is how how the organization is structured. And when, um, Joe was talking about uh, 
the reverse Conway maneuver, where um, in order to get the system you want, you, you structure your company so that it's going to build that, right? One of, the, one of the challenges that I've seen is, um, I'll talk a little bit about a past life real quick. We had a, a team where we were actually able to do zero-touch deployment. We would commit our code um, to, to master, to main, to make sure uh, it was working. And from that moment on, I didn't have to touch it. It went to prod. I didn't even care when, um, because once I had made sure it was good, it could, it could flow. Uh, we tried to recreate this at, at another company, and it failed completely. Not because we couldn't have recreated the technology that allowed us to do this, but because the organization wasn't set up to, to leverage it. So um, one of the biggest challenges that I see is that the, the changes to be able to make the systems that much better has to actually start outside of this, the computer systems. And it needs to start um, with an understanding of the difference between, a, a, lot of our, a lot of our systems are built sort of with the, the physical factory mindset, but we're doing knowledge work. And knowledge work is fundamentally different. So as we are uh, trying to do this knowledge work in an older paradigm that doesn't actually fit, sometimes we have to question some of our assumptions and say, oh, we've been, we've been treating, uh, I'll use this as an example, we've been treating QA uh, like we would treat QA prior to doing DevOps, and we're going we're gonna to write a bunch of code, and then we're going to have them check it for quality. Um, this doesn't actually work, and it doesn't allow you to actually do continuous delivery, because um, the, per the only person who can actually change, make the change to make it quality, is the dev. So if the organization still thinks of those two as discrete, discrete and independent steps, uh, you're going to have trouble getting to, to CICD. And you're going get, to having trouble getting to um, where you can, um, after you're done with your code, just having it flow. Yeah, I, th I see a lot of head nods. So yeah, absolutely, organization is often the biggest blocker, right? They set the schedules, they set the priorities, they set the budget. Um, go ahead, biggest blocker for you. Uh, I would say, since the legacy systems obviously still have to be used, I think the, the biggest difficulty is, or I would say two of the biggest difficulties are stability. So one, you have to you know still use the system, and then it's not working exactly as you want it to. So part of it is, is how do you build that stability? But then the second part is there are multiple teams, right? And they're all working on something. And, and recently, this was an issue of, of our, you know, our app was crashing, right? The app's crashing. Well, then it's like, well, let's fix the JVM. It's got to be the JVM. The JVM doesn't have enough memory. We just, we, we are scaling too high. We have too many customers. And, um, then it was sort of just like, okay, let's change the JVM, but also there were just other bugs. And actually, it turned out that it was a code change that a dev had made. So it was, well, who created the bug, right? So you want that stability, and then which team was actually responsible for the problem? And because there are extra, these extra variables of one, it's a, an older system, then who's responsible, right? And and who actually knows what's going on? and the JVM hadn't been changed for like seven years. So it's like, why is why is this now an issue? So I think that that you know responsibility of figuring out where the issue is also adds to that. Is is yeah, sure, I want my app to be stable, but then well, okay, I have to keep it up. Did I make a change? Did the dev make a change? And then we're sitting in a meeting, and the dev's like, we didn't change anything, but something. Had well, and how do you changed. make that collective, right? Like, because that can be a very unproductive ex ex finger pointing exercise, right? Like you did it, you, did, you know, and how do we collectively then change the communication patterns to be like, Hey, we did this. We are working together to solve a problem. And I think that's a key, like work through. Yeah. I was, um, so I wanted to echo the sentiments, uh, of the distinguished panelists over here <laughs> at the end. Hi, May. Uh, but uh, about the organization, I think like the biggest legacy system of all is the org chart, um, and it fundamentally needs to change. Now, 
uh, I wish, I don't know if they do, but I wish there was like a C-suite, something like this. Uh, I remember one time when I worked uh, for this large company, I won't mention them, but I went and talked to one of the board members and I was like, I'm trying to figure out how to get more DevOps adoption and this kind of thing. And she just looked at me and said, I have no idea what DevOps is. And um, oftentimes, as again, this comes back to engineers, because this, this, uh, maybe there's some CEOs in here, but they're not probably. Uh, and each day and day, they're out there doing their job. We're uh, doing our jobs. And one of the things is we just got to communicate what we're trying to accomplish and why it matters. And if the board, if we expect investment, sometimes billions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and we say they aren't investing in us, it was like, nobody can explain to them what the heck you're doing. So if you can't explain to them what the heck you're doing, why, why do you think they're gonna write you a blank check to do it? So um, yeah, I would say that's the biggest challenge, but to your point about how do we get to we, well, the answer is we get there and we all do it. And the engineers especially are the biggest uh, babies I've ever met, I think, um, especially when it comes to the product team or whatever. It's like, uh, they never give us what we need. And it's like, you guys can't even articulate what you need. So. Um, Maybe we start there. I have a suggestion. All right. Um, I saw a great example of this, actually, just recently. Um, and it comes down, I think, in a big part to how failure is treated. And the example that I saw is uh, there was a bug. And uh, the bug, we, we could tell there was a bug, but we didn't quite know where it was. Um, and then we found it. And... And this example, like, when I saw this happen, I was like, oh, I need to adopt that. Because um, the, the fearless leader of that group was like, yay, a bug, we found a bug, we can fix this. And it was, it was that enthusiasm and that attitude about, um, you know, not, oh, you screwed up, bang, right? Or Get like, blame. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, but it was about, hey, this is something we can now action on. Uh, yeah. The best news somebody can ever give you is that something is your fault. Why? Because you can do something about it. If it's not your fault, you're helpless. It's outside your circle of control. Yep. Nothing you can do. Yep. Uh, totally agree. One of, the best, one of the best things I saw when I worked at AWS is the way that they treated failure. And they're like, we have to review this. And at first I thought it was like, well, we have to review this. It's, you know, yell at somebody. I was like, no, we have to review this because we can learn things. And if we don't review this, we're leaning, leaving things on the table that we could have learned that will bite us later. And I, that was an amazing like, insight into why they're successful. Yep. <laughs> but I think this also starts to shift to why code is everything, or everything as code is so important. Because one, it provides traceability to who did what, when, where, and how. But it also enables the ability to effectively manage that when something does actually go wrong. So you can say, okay, well, Alice, you did this, so here's why that doesn't work. And it becomes an educational opportunity, becomes a comment in the code, and then it becomes a fix. Yeah. And it's a part of When I think it's best also when it's not Alice, it's we. Yes. Right, like it's not Alice, yeah. it's we screwed up. Yeah. All right, Bill, you've been holding on. So I, I think an important consideration too, especially in the in the legacy system I'm maintaining right now, is 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 a strong consideration around cost, right? Because uh, I'm maintaining this legacy system. We know it's going to be sunlit. You know, we don't know the exact time, probably the next six months or something like that. And so every time I look at a code or I look at a code fix or I look at a deployment, I have to think like, is it worth is it worth the company paying the money for me to spend time on this? Because this is going away, so there's basically a, a, a money bucket that, you know, there's not going to be an ROI. It's not going to be around for the next yeah. 10 years. So you again, going back to Gus. Yeah, Bowen, yeah, we haven't yeah. heard from you in a minute. So one thing I've learned with a lot of systems we work, so I work for the largest company in the world. There, I work for Walmart. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are more employees... In orientation, they told us there are more employees that work at Walmart than only two places in the world, the US government and the Chinese army. Wow. That was before COVID. In one year, we hired like 500,000 people. Wow. Not devs. That, that was like for, you know, shopping and fulfillment stores and stuff. 
Um, so my team, one of the things we do is we put stuff in each store as part of our caching. Uh, and I've learned to never treat, we've gone through a lot of decommissioning and a lot of shutting down older systems. Treat the system as if it's still in production and still real until it is shut down. Because, for example, one of the things we're shutting down is a whole data center. It's two years past the original date we projected to shut it down. And so you tend to like let some things go because, oh, it's gonna be shut down. We're not gonna, and then it comes back to bite you. Um, so what do you do? I mean, how do you deal with that? I, I run into that all it, the time. It's, it's really that mindset of like, oh, it's legacy. I'm not going to do anything. And then you, the other thing I've learned is like, the more you do something, the less problems you'll have later. If, if it's been two years since you last updated or deployed a system. Yeah, have fun with that and, one. And something goes wrong and you've lost that ability, then it's gonna take you that much longer to recover from something. Uh, so, um, yeah. So how, um, do you, how do you obtain that mindset that everything's prod to someone, that, that it's not just, I mean, and maybe that is part of the mindset is not calling things legacy, but hey, this is our current system. Yeah. Well, like it or not. That's, that's something I've had to shift. I went through the phase of like, oh, it's, it's going away. I don't have to deal with it until the past like two years. And I've been like, oh, I need to just treat them as if they're still there and real and valid. And they're not some odd thing that I can just leave behind. Or... Yeah. And that's always my favorite, too, because so often we say that thing is going away. But how often do we know how it's going away? Right? We're like, oh, yeah, the data center is going away. And then we turn around, and six months later, is that data center away? Because no one had a plan, or the plan wasn't executed, or it wasn't well thought through, or all the stakeholders weren't involved. So I, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, it just takes longer. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving everybody out. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add to that, because uh, it's uh, this changing the mindset, which is what I think you were driving at about like not being afraid to jump into the legacy system, because there's two things. One is, I don't care what system it is, it's a machine with a CPU, memory, and disk. So don't be afraid to jump, and it has an API. So don't be afraid to go change it and figure out how to do that well. And the second thing is, um, you can say, oh, that's the legacy system and never going to change, or we can't ever get things done because the legacy system It's like, well, well, first keep in mind that uh, you're building the legacy systems of tomorrow, number one. So. Be, <laughs> be nice to the future. Everything's yeah, legacy. exactly. And then the other piece is like, uh, well, you know, we all got a job to do and we got to figure out how to do it. So just jump in and start pulling the wires because you're not a SRE engineer. You're not a data engineer at the beginning. At the beginning of the day, you're an engineer first. And don't be afraid to figure out how, to, how the thing works and uh, fix it yep. and make it better. Yeah, I think that's one of the worst things about legacy systems is who owns the thing? Mm -hmm. Because I worked at previous company where there's literally 35, 40 year old uh, products that just work. And you ask, well, who's responsible for this? And they're like, I don't know. They probably retired 25 years ago. And nobody's touched it because it's continued to work. And then you're like, well, someone's got to manage this. And they're like, everyone's hands off, hands up. Like, it's we're just not worked for 20 that. years. Why would we touch yeah, it? Right? Exactly. I currently have a customer that has a COBOL system. Yeah, yeah a lot of banking. That, that still it still trend. runs, and yeah. they're like, well, yeah. why do we change it? We'd have yep. to retrain all our employees. We'd have to, like, we fly through this. This works perfect for our business. So how do we deal with that? I mean, what if legacy just works for the business? So one of the things that, from a security perspective, I love doing was just turning things off. Um, if you're familiar with chaos engineering, yep. it's the most hilariously Definitely. fun thing you can ever do that's going to scare everybody that doesn't know that you're doing it. Um, and when you get into the DevOps mindset and you're actually doing DevOps, that's what you should be implementing in your production environments. If what is being deployed doesn't meet what you want it to be, turn it off. Have those proactive slash reactive capabilities. Find out who owns it. Too. Exactly. Because as <laughs> soon as something, <laughs> be, exactly, because as soon as something gets turned off or all of a sudden doesn't get, um, up anymore, isn't available, someone's going to complain and then you're like, okay, great, 
your name gets put on this, and now you're responsible for it. And if it's a business person, you say, great, you're paying for it. Now go, where's your development team? How are you sourcing the people? Because a lot of times, business will say, you can't turn that off because this is a tool that I use. And that needs to be the conversation that comes back to say, okay, business, you want this product, you have to pay for it. And as soon as money's involved, going back to capital conversation, now all of a sudden it's like, well, do we really need that? Because now it's going to cost us this TCO of saying, okay, here's how much this costs to you. And that's one of the things with legacy systems is being able to actually articulate for X product, here's how much it costs the business, not just from an infrastructure standpoint. Because many of you probably have an IT organization and it's one giant bill that they pay, whether that's their own data centers or in the cloud, you have one bill that goes to IT. And the business doesn't care. They're like, spin up as many servers as you want. We're not paying the bill. But as soon as you start giving them that bill, as soon as you start attributing the cost to the business, there's some really great conversations that start to happen within that organization to say, yeah. Justify this for me, and for sure, like cost cost drives decisions, and I think it has to be not only the cost of how much does this system cost to maintain, but you know what is it costing you in speed of deployment? In hey, every deployment actually takes two years now because you know we're trying to support, and maybe that's okay, right? Maybe for the pace of business, that's okay, and, and maybe it has to come down to that as long as we're addressing the security concerns. You know, I'm sure if Walmart is not PCI compliant, there are problems. Every year, I go through PCI audit. <laughs> Your favorite time of year, right? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Weird thing, same time as tax time. Oh, uh, yeah. April 15th. Brilliant. It's like all auditors got together and said. Right, right there, right there. Other things you guys want to ask the panel? Other things you guys want to bring up? Oh, question in the back. All the way in the back. Do we have a mic back there? Yeah, you can yell. Uh, and I'll reiterate. Perfect. I'm going to try to summarize, and then you correct me because you have a mic now behind you oh. where I'm wrong. <laughs> you have created... a. T you make the point, again, somebody up here made the point as well that, hey, you are writing tomorrow's tech debt. Um, and sometimes we know that, like we're not doing things in the best way possible because we don't have the time or the money or to do all the things that we want. So how do we do that in a manner that's, uh, that's smart? Is that, is that a fair reprise of what you said? Um, part of that, and then also, um, are there times where you know, you know, you know you are acquiring tech debt and you are doing that intentionally, and that's a correct move. Have you ever done that yourself? Good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll go first, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, so the one thing I'll, I don't, first is, there's no such thing as the best solution, because there's like the perfectly engineered solution, whatever that should, could be, and, but then that always has to be set in the context of the marketplace, the money, all these other things. So there's uh, when we say tech debt, I actually don't like, I don't love this term because uh, it sort of gives license to engineers to think that they can kind of like, I'm not saying you're doing this, but I've seen it where they feel like, oh, we got to get this done quickly, so uh, I don't have time to do it right. And uh, that's not true because you always have time to think about the problem and the problem sits within a broader context and then figure out how to solve that problem in the best way given your constraints. So that's number one. And then number two, uh, tech debt is, at the end of the day, tech debt is a, is a, just like regular debt, it's a check or it's a, it's a, you're making a borrowing against the future. So when you make a decision about tech debt, to, if we're going to call it that, it's fine uh, as long as you do it intentionally and intelligently. And you're saying, so when is it, when do you make that decision? Well, like I'm in a startup, so we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have, recurring revenue much yet. So we have to make a lot of short-term decisions to get to that next milestone, whether it's a demo or a, a proof of concept with a customer or, or whatever that is. And we're making that short-term 
uh, benefit. So we're making a trade-off for short-term gain against a longer-term objective like scalability, changeability, all these things. But because there's no right way to do it, you have to always solve the problem within the broader context. You're not, you, 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 it doesn't just give you license to say, I don't have time to do it right. No, you do. Um, but you have, to fit, you have to understand the whole problem and, uh, and put it within that, that whole context. I definitely agree. Um, the other thing I would say is that there's there's two ways that people talk about tech debt. They talk about tech debt um, in the terms of uh, like what we wish we had done that we didn't, or or the, what we wish we hadn't done that we did. Um, but there's a more specific definition of tech debt out there, which is almost exactly what you were saying. It is the agreement that we are going to spend future velocity now. Now, that's a it's, a, it's a tricky trap to fall into because the moment you try to spend future velocity now, then you wanna turn around and get more velocity. The last thing you wanna do is pay that back. And if you don't have the discipline to do that, then you're gonna death spiral, right? Um, so making that agreement formal first of all, and saying, okay, this is what we could do, this is what we're now going to do that's not what we could do, and this is why. And uh, a practice that I've seen that uh, if you have a, a team that functions well enough to do this, congratulations, um, it, it is very powerful. It is where the moment you have that conversation, you put the, the next item that is going to be the paying that off into the priority queue so that you can't like, oh yeah, someday, right? Because someday never happens. No, for sure, you definitely have to do it. Go ahead, who's, somebody else is gonna I'll go try. for it. Yeah. Um, so in terms of technical debt, I mean, I, I think I've heard the term every time you write a Bash script, you've got technical debt. Anytime you do anything, you are starting to create technical debt. Um, I think all of us working in technology, there's always something. There's the next book, there's the next course. You know, you never run out of technical debt. And I think the question is, is maybe, uh, maybe better stated, how do I go back to something or pick something up and make it more palatable and something that I can actually work with? And my comment to that would be, is, is there's things I've done six months ago that I, I don't know, I don't remember what I did. But if you and your team are really diligent about documentation and you know create that second brain, whatever you do, and document what you do and how you did it, and down to the links that you looked at, that really helps. You know, comment your code. You're you're never going to get away from that technical debt 100%. But you can use tools to index your knowledge and then be able to go back later on and say, okay, this is what I did. And, and those, those are the things that I think we look at after a project's done, and we're like, well, the code's written, it works. But those are the things that are actually the real knowledge of, of how things work if we write it down and we document it that will actually you know, help the people that come after us. So, so is today's ourselves. technical debt tomorrow's legacy system? There's no tomorrow, <laughs> it's just today. Um, first, again, perfection is the enemy of progression. And so doing what's right is the better course of action. Unfortunately, right is subjective to the time in which you're making that decision. So as an organization, as development teams, as DevOps teams, you have to define what right means now, but also build in the mechanism to handle change. Because at some point in the future, something is going to change that is going to impact your capacity to understand whether you have technical debt or net. not. Everybody here got to deal with Log4j. Everyone here got to deal with Heartbleed. Those were things that we didn't know about that existed, and we had to deal with that change. So being right, doing what's right for a startup, for a long-term enterprise company has to be a team definition. You as a team define what do we consider to be right, build the mechanisms in to validate that things are going right, but understand that change is going to happen. 
And what do we do when change occurs? How do we ensure that our systems are capable of handling that change? Because again, you have known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And you need to plan on each one of those three aspects as a part of your team. Perfect. All right, we have time for one last question. Right in the back with a hand up. One last question or comment, and we are going to close this panel out. What would the panel suggest the best course of action for dealing with um, an engineer or developer who unintentionally, but good intentioned, uh, creates technical debt because of the repeated technology or tools that they continue to use? For example, if you have a Java developer, uh, everything looks like a tool or a problem that they can solve with Java, which doesn't necessarily make sense from a, a DevOps or CI CD perspective. How do you rein that person in without stomping on them? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think, at least for me, I'll take a stab at it. That's really a communication problem, right? Like, as we started out with, there are no really hard technology problems. There are really hard organizational problems. And I think it involves having a relationship with that person, right? To be somebody that you, they, you trust or they trust and be like, hey, we're going to work through this. You know, and, and it's hard because egos come into play. But I think it really becomes more of a mentoring and a working with, with problem than a, hey, you can try to solve it te technologically, technologically, but if you have a hammer, everything looks like an, a nail, right? And this person has the Java hammer or the Go hammer or whatever hammer they happen to have in their hand at the time. And I think it's really just mentoring and working and dealing with it on an organizational level rather than trying to solve the problem technologically because it won't, it won't happen. Any other comments on my way off base? No, nope, 100%. Yep. They may only have one tool, and so they solve it. Um, I, I like your, your mentoring comment. That's that's extremely important because uh, in, in my organization, I, I've dealt dealt with similar issues. I have people who are database experts, and they just do database things, and everything gets solved with a query, and ev everything gets you know views and stored procedures, and 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 sometimes you gotta 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 pull them back a pull little bit, and say, out, hey, yeah. this is faster if I if I do yeah. this over here. Communication. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, if someone is only using Java, for example, or stored procedures or something. It's sounds like it's mostly a, an education challenge because, you know, they have pressure to get things done and that, you know, things tied up with their own mind of wanting to be productive and all these things. So uh, giving space to learn new technologies would be one. And then the other thing I would just as like a, a point is like, particularly on Java, stored procedures may be a little different, but um, when it comes to questions of programming language, languages, especially in the containerized world where you can kind of isolate services and um, at the end of the day, it's all if statements and while loops. It doesn't really matter what language you're using. And uh, you can solve pretty much any problem with any language. So, in fact, that, that is, you know, that's the, the that, rule. That is what so, I learned in my 25 yeah. years. I yeah. came to that conclusion. I was just like, it's all, it's all yeah. the same underneath the hood. And, there, and there's good reasons. We're going to have conversations about what you support as an organization and how you deal with things. But, all right. I, first off, a big, huge round of applause to our panel. These were all just people that came to the conference like you and I today, um, and I, I really appreciate your opinions. It was fantastic.